happy to be able to uh, welcome our next speaker, Dr. Michael Cooklin, who is consultant cardiologist uh, with a speciality in electrophysiology and inherited arrhythmia conditions from Guy's and St. Thomas's uh, Hospital. And he's going to be doing a session for us on electrical testing in IAC. Over to you, Michael. Thank you. Thank you very much, Liam and Chris. Um, can you see my slides? Yes, we can. Great. Um, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, you and Chris have given me a, a challenging uh, topic to cover in, in 15 minutes, electrical tests in inherited cardiac conditions. I'll do my best and try not to overrun too much. So because it's such a big topic, perforce I've had to limit uh, what I'm covering. So I plan to discuss in a little detail a sodium channel blockade in the diagnosis of Brugada syndrome and exercise testing in the diagnosis of, of both long QT syndrome and catecholaminergic polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. And for the rest of this talk, refer to as CPVT. Um, let's start with, with Brugada syndrome. When you see patients like this, uh, an 18 year old woman uh, from Hong Kong who presents with syncope and has a family history of sudden cardiac death, there's no need to, to perform um, further provocative tests, any provocative testing. You can see in Leeds V1 and V2, the absolutely characteristic changes of Brugada syndrome with J point elevation, coved ST segment elevation and T wave inversion. Nowadays, this is probably uh, a minority of the type of patient that we see, um, and this perhaps is, is a more typical um, patient. And um, this was a 56 year old man who presented recently um, for screening following the sad death of his son um, overnight at the age of 26. And following an autopsy, um, he was diagnosed as a sad death. Our patient had normal baseline imaging and was referred for an Ashmaline test. Um, this is the baseline ECG. Leads V5 and V6 have been moved um, above leads V1 and uh, V2 into the third intercostal space for high right ventricular lead um, recording. As you can see, there's really no clue as to uh, a Brugada uh, phenotype on the resting ECG. Um, at our, about four and a half minutes into the infu injection, where most but not all of the asmoline had been delivered, um, the test was terminated due to the characteristic um, Brugada pattern. But fairly soon afterwards, um, ventricular ectopy was seen, and you can see the rather nasty, very wide left bundle type morphology uh, ectopic beats, presumably arising from the right ventricle, possibly the free wall. Um, with very wide QRS, probably due to um, slowed ventricular uh, action potential propagation in the, in the face of sodium channel blockade. Fortunately, this ectopy did not progress and um, fairly rapidly disappeared. And by 10 minutes, the ECG had returned towards, though perhaps not quite, to baseline. So the criteria for Brugada syndrome um, is based currently on the um, statement from 2013 where Brugada syndrome is diagnosed essentially where a type 1 ECG is seen either spontaneously or following sodium channel blockade, um, either recording from standard or high right ventricular lead positioning. We all know there are potential problems with this and um, a more recent uh, consensus statement was put out in 2016 suggesting that perhaps Brugada diagnosis should be uh, looked at more in the way of like uh, akin to long QT in terms of looking at the clinical setting patient symptoms and family history. Though to my knowledge the, the diagnostic uh, criteria um, have not yet been updated so these are the, the current criteria. Um, this shows you the standard V1, V2 and the high electrode lead positions for uh, undertaking sodium channel blockade test with electrodes positioned to the left and right of the sternum in the third and second intercostal spaces. This is from um, our St. Thomas's um, standard operating uh, 
policy for undertaking a national marine test. It's, it's in its final draft, so it's not yet um, formally in use, but it, it emphasizes the importance of careful preparation, um, selecting patients, um, checking there are no contraindications, perhaps uh, such as left bundle branch block, ensuring all your equipment is ready. And once the patient has been weighed, um, has intravenous access and the ECG electrode to the in position, we undertake administration of ashmolene at a dose of one milligram per kilogram to a maximum dose of 100 milligrams, injecting or infusing over five minutes. And we obtain EC, we, contain, we record ECGs continuously, but um, uh, we uh, print out every 30 seconds at least for the first 10 minutes. So the indications for stopping the ashmolene would be a positive test result, as you saw in that previous case, marked QRS or PR prolongation, marked uh, bradycardia secondary to sinus node or AV conduction problems, uh, recurrent or complex ventricular ectopy or sustained arrhythmias. Um, fortunately, we've rarely had to intervene by way of isoprenaline or indeed uh, undertake any resuscitation. The test is invasive and does carry a small risk. Um, and it's important to prepare carefully before undertaking the test. The vast majority of the tests are carried out uneventfully and as day cases. So there are some unresolved um, issues about sodium channel blockade, and I suspect Professor Bear will, will maybe discuss these in more detail later on today. The reference at the bottom is, is, a, is a review published very, very recently. We recognise the test is, is not a gold standard test, the um, post-test probability of a positive test indicating Brugada syndrome therefore will be affected by the pre-test probability and it is important to think carefully which patients we um, uh, offer the test to. So for instance whether a drug-induced type 1 ECG in isolation as per the 2013 guidelines definitely indicates a diagnosis of Brugada syndrome um, is difficult given that these patients, uh, in the absence of any symptoms, have a, a very, very good prognosis. We also have to think carefully what the accuracy of a test is in the patient who has no uh, baseline abnormalities, such as type 2 or type 3 changes, before they're given ashmolene. The 2016 uh, consensus document indicates um, the use of uh, sodium channel blockade in patients with with these um, uh, resting ECG changes, but we often carry out the test in, test in those without. It's also important to be aware that different agents that may be used, we use ashmolene, but uh, elsewhere flecainide and procainamide are used, have different um, pharmacological properties. Indeed, ashmolene is, is more powerful, for instance, um, a lot more powerful than procainamide, and this may uh, affect the uh, accuracy of the test and the risk of a false positive result. We know that false positive results may be present in a, a proportion of patients, potentially as high as four to six percent. So some unresolved issues um, remain. In the interest of time, moving on to long QT syndrome. Again, as per Brugada, there are times when we don't need further diagnostic tests. And this remarkable ECG uh, is from a patient who presented just uh, about 18 months, two years ago to us, having had um, a first presentation to hospital with syncope. Um, she'd had one episode about three years previously, but no other episodes. She was on no, re no regular medications and was otherwise well when she blacked out. Um, do note that the automated analysis package from the computer calculated her QT to be only 460 milliseconds corrected. But it's important to do the calculation yourself. Uh, this lady also had runs of torsade while she was on our coronary care unit and subsequently received a, 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 an ICD um, and beta blockade and was uh, identified as having um, a pathogenic KCNQ1 variant on genetic testing. More commonly, perhaps, is a patient such as this, a 22 year old woman who was referred to us. Um, for screening following the diagnosis in, of long QT syndrome in her mother, who was the proband, um, who had presented symptomatically, been diagnosed and subsequently found to have, again, a, a KCNQ1 variant. Her brother had been uh, uh, diagnosed with long QT uh, on predictive testing. Uh, 
So this lady that we saw in clinic was well, she had no symptoms and following a normal baseline ECG underwent an exercise test. This is her baseline ECG pre-exercise with, with a normal corrected QT interval. At just under four minutes into recovery, this was her ECG. And whilst um, it may be difficult to calculate the QT interval as the patient's relatively tachycardic and the T wave runs into the P, I hope you'll agree that the, the QT is significantly prolonged. If we use the, the tangent method that uh, Mark uh, referred to in the previous talk, where you extend a, a tangent from the steepest part of the downstroke to the baseline as shown on this slide, the corrected QT was over 550 milliseconds. So the diagnosis of long QT syndrome may, may be straightforward in the presence of repeated ECG showing a long QT, but often we rely on the uh, Schwartz score and a score of 3.5 or greater in the absence of secondary cause for QT prolongation um, is felt to indicate a high probability for long QT syndrome. The Schwartz score was modified in 2011 and the potential utility of an exercise test incorporated. So the, the Schwartz score looks at ECG findings, which include the QT interval at baseline and response to exercise. Um, presence or absence of uh, torsard, uh, notching in the T waves and very rarely T wave, uh, macroscopic T wave alternans, and then other features such as the clinical history and the family history. As regards exercise testing, uh, a QT interval, correct QT interval of 480 or greater, uh, four minutes into recovery, uh, awards you a point in the modified Schwartz score. Remember that 3.5 points or greater is required to make the diagnosis. A number of papers have been published on this, on exercise testing in diagnosing long QT, and, and the potential value of this has been known for a long time. But these are probably the two key papers, one by Andrew Cram and the second by Michael Ackerman, looking at the, um, the utility of recovery phase um, uh, exercise testing for, for diagnosing long QT. The um, flowchart on the left is from Andrew Kran's paper um, looking at the utility in patients with borderline normal QTs, looking at their uh, QT intervals at four minutes recovery, but also interestingly raising the possibility of being able to help identify the underlying genotype by comparing the one minute and four minute um, recovery QT intervals. Um, without going into detail, there does appear to be some hysteresis into the QT response in patients with long QT type 2, whereby they, their QT interval will shorten late in exercise and early recovery because the IKS channel is working normally, but then becomes prolonged at four minutes. So looking at the one minute and four minute recovery time can potentially help you to distinguish between the two. The exercise test does seem to be most valuable in um, helping making a diagnosis of long QT1, and as mentioned, may have potentially some value in long QT2, and from Michael Ackerman's study, also long QT3. The four minute cutoff value of 480 milliseconds seem to be the best one for um, uh, specificity for diagnosing long QT. And of note, the presence of beta blockade at the time of the test does not seem to affect the test um, validity. And there are a number of issues with the exercise test and whilst not having time to go through all these in detail, it's important to note that in these two studies, all the patients were either first degree relatives of patients who uh, uh, had confirmed long QT syndrome or were patients who had had um, confirmed long QT syndrome themselves. So this, these papers did not include patients who just had a slightly prolonged QT or a possible family history. Um, we know that 20 to 25% of our patients who have long QT syndrome um, have um, negative genetic testing. So the, the utility of the exercise test in that case is, is perhaps less clear. As already mentioned, the Bazette correction formula does carry a bias, particularly noting that at fast heart rates, it tends to overcorrect. Hopefully using the four minute recovery ECG is a way to minimize that where the heart rate hopefully will have dropped, although at times the patients do remain tachycardic, as you saw in, in the case shown earlier. 
Moving on finally to CPVT, um, again starting with a, a brief but interesting case. This was a 17-year-old woman who we saw a few years ago who gave a three-year history of syncope triggered by emotion. And um, this young lady was at school and the teacher made her stand up because she was using her mobile phone and she felt dizzy and blacked out. She had no family history um, and a normal uh, baseline ECG and echo. She underwent an exercise test I'll show you in a moment and subsequently was put on by Soprolol and had a loop recorder implanted. This was her baseline ECG. And within uh, about 90 seconds of exercising, she developed uh, Pygemony and a um, polymorphic couplet. In a minute of further exercise, um, she developed complex ectopy, including um, a non sustained run of bidirectional um, ventricular tachycardia. She was put on by Soprolol. A repeat exercise test showed reduced ectopy, and she had a loop recorder inserted. It was um, so. I'll show you those traces in a moment, but just to, um, from her loop recorder in a moment, but just to comment that the typical findings in patients with CPVT are late coupled, and this is because this is calcium over uh, overloading, as mentioned previously, with uh, delayed um, after depolarizing, after depolarizations. Late coupled ventricular ectopic beats typically arising where the sinus rate is 110 to 130 beats a minute. And then if exercise continues, more complex ectopy, non-sustained ventricular tachycardia, and sometimes though by no means not always, bidirectional uh, non-sustained ventricular tachycardia. Uh, atrial arrhythmias are common in CPVT, but are only seen in less than 25% of patients on a treadmill. A clue to CPVT may also be an underlying resting bradycardia, but of course a lot of the patients that we assess are young, and often have uh, bradycardia anyway, so this is often not a helpful finding. So coming back to this lady, she had a loop recorder put in and remarkably, not long afterwards, suffered this episode of bidirectional VT and subsequent VF that fortunately um, self-terminated. Um, she received an ICD and then had an exercise test carried out on Nadalol, where she remained symptomatic on exercise, and you can see by Gemini during her treadmill test, and you can see that with exercise, if you look at the panel on the left, in the later stages of exercise, she gets increasing amounts of ventricular ectopy. We then repeated the test on Nadalol and Flecainide, and this almost completely suppressed her ectopic beats. Here's uh, peak exercise, stage five, and you can see again very little, if any, ectopy um, on her repeat exercise with flecainide in addition to nadolol. Um, so again, according to um, our current guidelines, CPVT is diagnosed in the presence of a structurally normal heart, normal ECG, and unexplained exercise or catecholamine induced bidirectional VT or polymorphic uh, ventricular ectopy or VT in an individual under 40 years of age. Um, there are some issues with regards to exercise testing for CPVT. Um, whilst a positive test is, is highly predictive of CPVT, a negative test is unreliable in ruling it out. Now, there may well be a difference in the um, uh, predictive value, sensitivity and specificity when comparing symptomatic patients to perhaps asymptomatic um, first degree relatives. But even in symptomatic patients, um, the reliability of inducing arrhythmias on exercise tests cannot be guaranteed and repeat tests are often needed. Beyond the scope of this talk is the possible role of an epinephrine challenge. Um, the optimal protocol for testing is not established and it may be that um, uh, burst testing is preferable to graded exercise. Uh, this is an area that's still not certain and interestingly a paper was published on burst exercise testing just last year with a sum total of six patients. So there's clearly a lot more information we need. The optimal criteria for a positive test is also not um, uh, clearly established. Um, looking at one study cited here, if we use non-sustained ventricular tachycardia and especially bidirectional non-sustained VT, sensitivity was 20%, um, much less if you just used bidirectional non-sustained VT. Using less stringent criteria, perhaps by Gemini or multifocal couplets, then the sensitivity clearly increased. 
So more again, more information required. So this is a very quick run through of a, of a large topic and my uh, brief conclusions are as follows. And provocative electrical testing is often required to facilitate the diagnosis of the inherited arrhythmia syndromes. The sodium channel blockade challenge and exercise testing remain key investigations for diagnosing Brugada syndrome, long QT and CPVT. And whilst these tests are clearly valuable, there are significant gaps in knowledge and careful thought is required before requesting the test, especially the sodium channel blockade test, and also when analysing the results. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Cook, for that. that was a wonderful uh, tour of all the common tests we use uh, for these conditions. Um, I hope you can join us for the panel discussion uh, at the end of this session uh, with some follow-up questions we have from your talk as well, please.